The King is finally back. After almost a week since it was lowered to the ground, SpaceX yesterday reinstalled the hot staging ring onto Booster 9. The whole process went extremely smoothly this time around, despite the prolific 70 meter height of the Booster 9, kudos to the crane operators. The hot stage ring is actually affixed to the booster through the ship clamp system, which facilitates convenient installation and removal. This system enables technicians to access critical components like the grid fin motors and avionics situated on the forward dome of B9. The hot stage ring is equipped with a set of ship clamps on its upper surface. But back to the current status of Starship, the crown seems to have stayed the same. This means that there wasn't and still aren't any problems with this hot stage ring. Instead, SpaceX seems to have performed unknown maintenance to the top of the booster forward dome. Perhaps it's a bit greedy to hope for, but we hope that the fully stacked Starship will happen soon, and then launch to orbit. Though, that dream won't be coming true anytime soon. While SpaceX awaits the Forest and Wildlife Service's approval of its launch pad for the next Starship orbital flight, the firm has recently filed an application with the FCC to allow it to communicate with Starship during the test. The filing lists January as the start date for the Starship test campaign, and such filings are a regular affair as SpaceX keeps the window open for operations as it develops the world's largest rocket in Boca Chica, Texas. However, as opposed to a filing earlier this year, which was also for the second Starship test flight, this one is limited in nature. The earlier filing, which surfaced in May, less than a month after the Starship orbital test flight, had covered the first stage booster, the launch pad, the full Starship vehicle, and the second stage. However, the latest filing seeks authorization from the FCC to communicate with the Starship booster and the launch site. It's unclear clear whether SpaceX has filed other applications with the FCC for clearance of the full vehicle and flight. This could indicate that the firm is planning non-orbital tests for the Starship or that it has filed separate requests for clearance. As for the other parts, SpaceX's Starbase is still very busy and still interesting to follow. Specifically, Ship 29 experienced a cryo-proof test at SpaceX's Massey's testing facility yesterday, currently sitting on a puck shucker stand. Impressively, both liquid oxygen and methane tanks are being cryo-loaded with liquid nitrogen. Full tanks on its very first test. I think that may be a first for a Starship prototype, which is a very good sign that proof testing is getting more optimized as designs mature. At the same time, Ship 26 has been hooked up to Marvin via the squid yet again, and still hasn't had a sniff of cryo-loading nor engine tests, which may happen this week. The latest booster prototype, Booster 13, had its common dome stacked onto aft tank 2, 3, and 4 in Mega Bay 1. Also, Ship 31, after patiently waiting all weekend, is also stacked onto the forward dome, common dome, and mid-liquid oxygen sections. In other notable activity, earlier this week, Marvin lifted sections of the external staircase onto the OLIT. Initially, we thought it may go as high as the SQD arm, but it sure looks like the arm now. Who knows, it might go all the way up. In short, we're in for an interesting ride with SpaceX's Starbase, and we'll have to keep our eyes peeled for further indications of what exactly is being tested and how exactly it will be tested. Right now, this may be one of the most exciting things to see. SpaceX just revealed an operation of over 8,000 space lasers across the Starlink satellite constellation enabling faster internet. On September 26th, SpaceX's Starlink division shared a photograph of a Starlink satellite stack and gave a first close-up look of the space laser hardware that is installed on the newest fleet of Starlink version 2 mini satellites. Quote, our next generation Starlink optical space lasers, pew pew, were launched to orbit on Monday, end quote, the company shared. The space laser feature, formerly called the optical inter-satellite links, is designed for satellites to communicate in orbit to provide faster data transfer directly from one satellite to the other without the need of each satellite receiving data directly from a local Starlink gateway ground station on Earth. Light travels faster in the vacuum of space than through fiber optic cables underground, making Starlink internet significantly faster than traditional internet infrastructures. With more than 8,000 space lasers across the constellation, Starlink satellites are able to connect thousands of kilometers apart, beyond the view of ground stations, and maintain pointing accuracy 
accuracy to enable data transfer of up to 100 gigabits per second on each link, shared Starlink representatives via X. Starlink's laser mesh network allows us to provide truly global coverage and serve those in the most remote locations on Earth, including maritime and aviation customers. Recently, SpaceX also shared a rare view of the Starlink satellites being deployed by Falcon 9's upper stage. Engineers have upgraded the satellites to make them less reflective to ground-based astronomers. Developed in-house, the dielectric mirrors on the surface of the satellites and extremely dark black paint for angled surfaces or those not conducive to mirror adhesion help absorb and redirect light away from the ground, shared the company. We firmly believe in the importance of protecting the night sky for all to enjoy, which is why the Starlink team has been working with lead astronomers around the world to reduce satellite brightness. As of today, SpaceX operates approximately 4,827 Starlink satellites in LEO, which provide high-speed internet service to over 2 million subscribers across 60 countries. The company is launching Starlink missions on a weekly basis to rapidly build a more reliable broadband satellite network that will be capable of serving millions of more customers globally. Since 2019, Starlink has demonstrated it is a reliable internet service that has been useful in remote regions where internet was previously completely unavailable, like the Amazon forest in South America and regions across Canada and Alaska. Most recently, the network started to provide service in some African countries that also did not have access to the World Wide Web. Starlink Internet Access has provided new opportunities for students to enhance their education, which will be beneficial for their future. And for our final topic of the day, which is now turning to be a rainy one, sorry for the extra noise here, outgoing space station commander Sergei Prokopiev and his two Soyuz crewmates co-pilot Dmitry Petalin and NASA astronaut Frank Rubio packed up Tuesday for a fiery plunge back to Earth early today to close out a year-long stay in orbit, the longest flight in U.S. space history. When the trio launched in September of 2022, they expected to spend six months aboard the International Space Station, the normal tour of duty for a long-duration crew. But a coolant leak disabled their Soyuz MS-22-68S ferry ship last December prompting the Russians to launch a replacement, the Soyuz MS-23-69S, last February. That meant Prokopiev, Petalin, and Rubio had to stay aloft an additional six months to put the Russian crew rotation schedule back on track. If all goes well, they will finally head home for Wednesday, undocking from the space station at 3.54 a.m. EDT and landing on the steppe of Kazakhstan at 7.17 a.m. EDT. Prokopiev, Petalin, and Rubio are being relieved by Soyuz MS-2470S Commander Oleg Kononenko, Flight Engineer Nikolai Chubb, and NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara, who arrived at the space station on September 15th. Mogesen flew to the lab last month aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft along with NASA's Jasmine Mugbelli, Japanese astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. Prokopiev, Petalin, and Rubio plan to bid their seven station crewmates farewell overnight Tuesday, load into their replacement Soyuz MS-20 23-69S ferry ship and await undocking from the Russian multi-port Prikol module. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. After a fiery plunge back into the atmosphere, the Soyuz crew module, suspended below a large parachute, is expected to settle to a jarring touchdown on the steppe of Kazakhstan near the town of Jeskazgan, about three and a half hours after undocking. Assuming an on-time touchdown, the crew will have logged 370 days, 21 hours, and 22 minutes off-planet in a voyage spanning 5,936 orbits and 157 million miles. Prokopiev's total time in space over two flights will total 568 days. The late cosmonaut Valery Polyakov holds the world record for the longest single flight, a 438-day stay aboard the Russian Mir space station in 1994-95. to Prokopiev, Petalin, and Rubio will move to number three on the list just behind retired cosmonaut Sergei Avdeyev, who logged a 380 day stint aboard Mir in 98 to 99. The longest previous U.S. flight was carried out by Mark Vandehey, who spent 355 days aboard the International Space Station in 2021 to 22. And that's all, folks. If you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description below. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.